Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and I'm going to start this episode with a huge thank you to you, our listeners, for sending in amazing feedback and topic suggestions. We read them all and answer them, and we've put together some great episodes and guests based on your input. You can always reach out to us via email, info at informedpregnancy.com, and on Instagram or Twitter at Dr. Berlin, spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-B-E-R-L-I-N. And while you're on the Instagram profile, just click on the link to find all of our other media, including documentaries and our YouTube series, The Real Midwives of Los Angeles. Speaking of real midwives, we have one in the studio right now. Momentarily, we'll be talking about a labor support option that I think many people don't even know exists, and it's called Monetrice Care. Our guest has midwifery in her blood. As a second-generation midwife, she has pursued a career in helping other women on their paths to motherhood through the power of birth. She's a monetrice, but she's also a midwife licensed through the Medical Board of California. She has attended hundreds of births and runs her own private practice called Heart to Home Midwifery. Abby Vidigan, welcome to the podcast. Hi. I'm excited to have you here because I'm fortunate <laughs> enough to get to just like talk birth with you all the time. Yeah. And uh, it's passion for both of us. And I always learn a lot when I talk to you. So I feel lucky to share you with our audience. Um, in this episode today, we're going to talk about monotrees care, what it is and what it isn't, and who might be best to benefit from that type of support, and who probably wouldn't be a great person for that type of support. But first, I want to learn about you. I think that midwifery is a labor of love and a crazy, chaotic life, and nobody goes into it lightly. So what made you become a midwife? So when I just want to say I'm super excited to be here. So thank you for having me. (laughs) I guess, so part of my interest in birth started as a child. Um, My mom taught childbirth education classes when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Um, And so when I was seven or eight years old, they found an old birth atlas, which they don't make them anymore. Um, but what is it? A birth atlas. It was it was this really large graphic book, um, and by graphic I mean that it had pictures in it that detailed sort of the physiology and anatomy of birth, but also showed pictures, drawn pictures of birth taking place and how it occurred and how the baby moved through the body. And my mom always spoke so fondly of her five births. She had five unmedicated births. I was born right here at Cedar Sinai. Which one were you? I was number three. Ooh, the middle <laughs> child. Yes, but I'm the oldest girl, so I think technically <laughs> oh, I, I fall under the older child. Oh, I see. Um, and but she always talked about it as if it was running a marathon. You know, it, you you get you get through the first twenty miles, and you're like, okay, this is great, I can do this. And then the last six miles, you're kind of questioning your decision to go unmedicated. But who turns around it? You know, for the last six miles. Mm, I um, would. It's, <laughs> I'm just saying. I wouldn't have started. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if we're running a marathon, I run by like a coffee bean. <laughs> Um, and so she always spoke so fondly of them. And so I, I always knew I wanted an unmedicated birth. And when I, you know, I, but I don't think midwifery ever occurred to me. And, and my aunt is a midwife. And I had the pleasure of going down to her office every so often when I was a student at USC. And I saw the relationship that would develop with her clients. And it really was a beautiful thing. And I think at the time, I knew that I would want a midwife when I got pregnant. But midwifery wasn't necessarily calling to me at the time. Um, so I went to USC. I graduated with a degree in political science, moved to Washington, D.C. Were you on um, the rowing team? Was I in the what? Rowing team? Definitely not. No. <laughs> uh, what's Nor your... did I pay $500,000 to get in. Oh, I, I paid $500,000 because <laughs> my kids go to private school. <laughs> <laughs> so As you They mind. call it the family fee. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, wait a second. Your aunt, who's the midwife, your mother's sister? Yes. Okay. How did they get into natural birth? The generation before us. Um, It was so not cool then. No, it definitely wasn't. Um, And they both had unmedicated births. I think my mom started it, being the first one to give birth, and my aunt was there. So my aunt was actually at my birth, which was really special when she ended up catching my baby. Oh, my goodness. Um, But um, So she used to joke that my mom would paint her nails in labor, that that was the type of, of woman, that was the type of labor she was. And so I think she, you know, sort of gave my aunt this idea that it was this really easy one, like just easy thing to get through. And so then my aunt tried it out. And of course, my aunt tells a very different story of what her labors were like. What was her labor like? Well, you told me that if I use explicit language that you would cut (laughs) it from the podcast. But she would tell me about how how she screamed the F word so loud that it would echo through the halls. Oh, wow. Um, But she did unmedicated births. She did did do unmedicated births. 
she I don't know how much she she would want me talking about the details of yeah, it. Yeah, sure. I wish it uh, right. <laughs> but um it wasn't it, it certainly wasn't the births that my mom had or the way that my mom described births, which I think was part of the reason why she ended up becoming a midwife was because even though she went unmedicated, there was still trauma attached to it. But I think my my grandmother had kids in the generation of twilight sleep and with her third birth, which was my aunt, she made a deal with her doctor at the time um, she asked him if she could stay awake for the birth and if he wouldn't cut an episiotomy on her. Mm. And he said, as long as you don't gain more than 15 pounds. Oh, my goodness. So she didn't. And she went into the hospital in labor, ready to give birth awake. And he lied to her. Oh, um, and so she was put to sleep, baby taken out, <sighs> an episiotomy cut. And so I think that there was a deep feeling within my grandmother that she had the power to have given birth without any of those things, which I think she then ingrained in my mother, who worked in a hospital for a few years before she got pregnant. And so, you know, growing up with women who had these wonderful stories of giving birth unmedicated and the, the body's ability to do so, I remember thinking that that was just always the birth that I would have, that I wouldn't want an epidural, I wouldn't need an epidural. And I actually remember being surprised as I got into my 20s hearing that so many women or, and so many women that I knew were having medicated births. But I knew that when it came time for me to have a baby, that it would be different. So, But it's like 97%. It is, right? yeah. Something like that. And I was one of the first of my friends to have a baby. So I didn't have that many friends that had gone in that had had medicated births. But I certainly had enough people in my life telling me that I was crazy mm -hmm. um, or that I would change my mind in the moment. But I also had, you know, these really strong women figures in my life that were telling me, you won't need it. And so I found myself in Washington, D.C. with my political science degree working in politics. And I got pregnant. And uh, my husband and I both at the time worked for nonprofits. So we had really good insurance, but we didn't necessarily <laughs> make the most amount of money. And so I found a really good midwife practice that practiced out of GW Hospital. But you had the option of a water birth. They had their own birth suites, they called them, with their own nursing staff. So essentially, by signing up for their care, you were agreeing to hire a doula. You were agreeing to strive for an unmedicated birth. And that's all the things I was looking for. And then at the same time, my insurance was going to cover 100% of it. Okay. So sort of midwific birth at the hospital. Yeah. And all of the midwives in that practice, if you kind of go into the politics of, of midwifery in the D.C. and Maryland area, a lot of the midwives who had worked in birth centers actually shifted into a hospital setting in the 90s when laws made it so restrictive for birth centers to be able to operate. Hmm. So all of the midwives actually that I had or that I was seeing at the time had all trained in an out-of-hospital birth setting, some of them for over 20 years. Wow. Um, so they were very natural birth-minded. So I went on to have a beautiful, unmedicated birth with my son. I did not do it in water. He was persistent. Uh, he actually came out OP, so he was posterior. Um, I pushed for a long time. Did you have back labor? A lot of it, yeah. Well, so it sounds, were you not painting your nails? Was it more F-bombs or nail painting? Was, uh... Surprisingly, I find that labor is probably the only time in my life that I stay quiet for an extended period oh, of wow. time. <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm a silent laborer. I did have sort of like your, the classic back labor. I felt like I just wanted to sit on the toilet for hours on end because there was just so much pressure in my lower back. I did end up hiring a really wonderful doula, and my husband was... Uh, she had come in and taught us childbirth education classes, and I think he was well-versed in sort of understanding what it was going to be like. And he literally sat by my side with a fist in my back for hours on oh, end. Wow. But I, you know, I, I showed up to the hospital complete. Um, oh, my goodness. That's great. Not, not quite ready to push yet, but my Did midwife— Did you know? That I was complete? Yeah. No. Um, I actually, I think if I remember correctly, when my doula called the midwife, she said, I'm not sure if she's ready to come in, but you can bring her in. Oh, okay. And I, in hindsight, I believe I was shifting out of transition because my contractions definitely spaced out. At the, they had been right on top of each other, and then they spaced out a little bit, what we call now like the rest and be thankful phase before mm -hmm. pushing starts. Um, and when I got there and she talked to me, I think she was surprised to find that I was complete. She asked me if I had an urge to push. I said, not quite yet. I was feeling pressure, but not quite yet. And she kind of let me do my thing for a half an hour or so before I started to feel a really strong urge to push. Given that I was a first-time mom and that he was posterior, I pushed for quite a while, um, about three hours and 20 minutes. Oh, wow. But my midwife was wonderful. I mean, she supported me in pushing in any position I could think of. I started out in a squat. I was left sideline. I was hands and knees. I... Um, at a certain point, she said, I think we should head over to the toilet. And that's actually where he crowned, was on the toilet. Oh, no kidding. You almost had a water birth. 
Almost. <laughs> a different kind. <laughs> and it was about as non-interventive as you could have wanted for a hospital birth. I mean, it really was. My midwife was, was wonderful and supportive, and no one talked to me about a C-section, no matter how long I pushed for it. And she was, you know, she stood there on the other side of the bathroom with me with a Doppler in hand and a flashlight to be able to check heart tone so I didn't have to be attached to the bed at all times. And it, it really, my midwife was wonderful, but the hospital experience as a whole left me with so much to be desired. Um, in you know, what way? Like, what about the hospital? I think wasn't? it was everything that happened in the postpartum period that oh. was hard. Because, you know, my midwife is there. She's there with me for a few hours. I'll never forget. She asked me if she could take a picture of my son's head. Because he had not, right. you know, the he not the molding that goes back, but he had literally straight up like from Conehead Traffic the movie, Con. just oh, wow. a classic OP um, molding. And uh, she said it was the most impressive head she'd ever seen. <laughs> oh, I still kind of hold that as a badge of honor. <laughs> um, but it was everything after. It was, you know, taking him to weigh him for 20 minutes. And, and every cell in my body was screaming to have him back in my arms when he was across the room from me. And this sort of this, this back and forth about, um, you know, the eye ointment and, um, every, and just signing waivers and all these things when I'd literally just given birth. Mm. And then, you know, you stay for a day in the hospital and, and there's poking and prodding and there's this pediatrician thinks that his jaundice levels are too high and this one thinks that they're fine. And This little piggy went to market. <laughs> it was like no one could get on the same page. And this pediatrician's telling me I have no milk, but then the lactation consultant is coming in and saying, you're a milkmaid. This is amazing. Look how much milk you have. And I couldn't wait to get out of there. But then I came home sleep deprived and tired because someone had been knocking on my door every two hours and the baby nurse couldn't get on on the same schedule as the postpartum nurse so that everyone could just come in and do their thing at the same time and then they would come in and they would wake him up and I I just couldn't get any sleep and I came home anxious and tired and somewhere around 38 weeks I remember you know sitting there I, I was kind of on improvised bed rest because I'd been having some preterm contractions since about 35 weeks and I remember it just something clicked inside of me where I said I'm going to be a midwife And I called up my aunt and I said, I think I want to be a midwife. And she said, you're about to have a baby. And I said, I know. But something about this process and the relationship that I've developed with my midwife and the relationships I've always seen you build with your clients, there's something so uniquely special about it that I think I want to be a midwife. Hmm. She said, well, I'll give it some time Mm -hmm. and see where, you, you know, see where it leads you. And and then I had this, you know, beautiful unmedicated birth. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to do this every day, but I can't physically give birth every mm, day. Yeah. And I don't want to be pregnant every day. It's so funny because usually hear the opposite. <laughs> like, I'm never doing that no, again. I remember feeling like I could scale mountains after it was done with. And I hadn't slept in 36 some odd hours, but I remember feeling like I could run that marathon. <laughs> How did you get, what was the path from there to midwife? So I, I started out light because now I had a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and from growing up around my aunt, I understood a bit of the lifestyle. You know, she she ran out on family dinners. She ran out on Christmas with her family. She would run out on birthday parties. I mean, I remember the night I moved to D.C., she had a going away party for me, and I had to go say goodbye to her outside a laboring woman's house. Oh, wow. And I remember being able to hear her inside, but that yeah, was the only way. Yeah, it's a crazy life. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was the only way I could see her before I left. And so I... Signed up to take a childbirth education training because that's something easy I could do with the baby. And then as soon as I felt like he, like my son was old enough for me to be on call, I started slowly taking doula clients with the expectation that I was going to be going to midwifery school shortly after that. Hmm. And so right around the time that he was about 16, 17 months old, my husband said, all right, I'll apply already to do it. <laughs> and so I applied to midwifery school and I was accepted, you know, for the, the incoming class. And that's when I started. And I immediately started attending births with my aunt, which was a really uniquely special opportunity for me to have this woman who was literally there for my birth, who saw me the moment I was born. Um, My doctor actually apparently at the time knew that my aunt had such an interest and love of birth that he actually took her hands and allowed her to catch me. Wow. And so to be able to apprentice with her was just such an amazing, uniquely special opportunity for me um, to really see her in action in a different way. So I I apprenticed with her. I apprenticed with Lindsay Mealy's, who is in the same office as my aunt, um, so two midwives down in Orange County. And then also I attended births for about a year and a half with Dr. Fishbein. Oh, wow. Um, I love to seek out knowledge, and I thought that the opportunity to see the type of births that he is able to attend that we can no longer attend, so breaches and twins, 
Um, I wanted to see all that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know how to do those things from a real life perspective as opposed to just learning them in school because sure, it's it's very rare that you're going to have a surprise twin, but a surprise breach happens. Sure. And I didn't want to be the midwife who didn't know how to handle it. It's uh, Yeah, we have an episode with a three-part series with Dr. Stu called Double Standard, mm -hmm. uh, which is about a home breach and twin delivery, twin with one breach, with Dr. Stu and the couple that had the baby. Yeah, I, I was there. there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with Abby Vidikin talking about Monatrice Care. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We're talking to Abby Vidikin. Um, your journey to midwifery is, now I understand the passion behind everything <laughs> that you do. I mean, there's a lot of midwife in your blood. I said it in the opening, but now I really <laughs> feel it. So in addition to, a, a lot of people listen to our podcast when they're trying to figure out what kind of birth they want to have. Sometimes people never think about it until towards the end of a pregnancy or middle of a pregnancy. Sometimes people know from very early on, like you did, what they want. And then once they start to figure out the options, you know, there's so many options here in Los Angeles, home birth, hospital birth. You can do a home birth with an obstetrician, hospital birth with a midwife and everything in between, mm -hmm. um, medicated, unmedicated, vaginal, surgical. Uh, there's so many choices. One choice that often goes overlooked is the choice of monotrice care. What is a monotrice? So essentially, a monotrice is a licensed midwife. Um, in the state of California, we have to be licensed through the Medical Board of California. So we are licensed midwives who support a laboring mom in the home environment, and then but transition to the hospital for the actual birth process. So as midwives, we can obviously do vaginal exams. We can administer medications at home. So if the mom needed IV fluids in labor, wanted antibiotics in labor, we can do those things. And I feel part of a midwife's training is, you know, therapeutic touch and helping a woman through labor very much like a doula does. So a monotrice essentially can act as a medical care provider at home and then help a mom transition to the hospital for birth. So that client will still see her OB. She will still have, or midwife in hospital, she'll still have obstetrical care throughout pregnancy. And then, you know, typically with my monotrice clients, I meet with them usually in about four-week intervals, depending on at what point they hire me during the pregnancy process, so that they still have all the benefits of midwifery care. I think any woman who goes to an OB knows that typically those appointments can be pretty short. I believe if you look up the average length of a doctor's appointment during pregnancy, it's roughly five to seven minutes long. And that doesn't leave a lot of time to answer questions or to talk about a woman's concerns, especially when it comes to first-time moms. There's a lot of concerns that come up during pregnancy. Whereas in the midwifery model of care, our appointments are usually 45 minutes to an hour long. I have a tough time cutting my appointments to 45 minutes, so they're typically an hour long. And we discuss things that are very relevant to midwifery care that OBs don't necessarily put as much stock into because, you know, not that it doesn't matter to your OB whether you have a medicated or an unmedicated birth, but, you know, in the midwifery model of care, especially in the home birth community, our goal is to stay home and have an unmedicated home birth. So, you know, we talk about things like fetal positioning, exercises that help during pregnancy to ensure that a baby is positioned right for an easier, smoother birth. And we talk about the, the role of nutrition and making sure that you stay low risk. In preparation for birth, like what are your wants? What are your desires? What, what type of environment are you looking for? Who have you hired as part of your birth team? If you are planning a hospital birth, what's your goal? At what point do you want to get there? Do you want an epidural? Like what are you looking for exactly? So, you know, we spend, we spend a lot of time talking to our clients about their desires. And then also because we're medically trained, we can answer questions that they have relating to common pregnancy complaints or, hey, I've got a cold. What natural remedies do you have for me? Yeah, so a lot of times people ask me when I bring up the concept of even a doula, uh -huh. there's a lot of confusion about what is a doula versus a midwife. Yeah, and, and I get that all the time. And they're so different. Your your midwife is your medical provider. Right. And a doula, very deliberately, is your non-medical provider. They have <laughs> no medical training and they have no medical benefits in terms of they can't do anything medical. We do as a doula. We do comforting touch. We do a lot of psychological first mm -hmm. aid. We help you understand your choices so you have a voice to advocate. But there's nothing medical diagnostic. 
diagnostically or therapeutically by what doulas Mm-mm. do. So, and and the midwife is essentially like medically trained. How long is right. is midwife training? Um, so I think the shortest program is about is three years. Um, so it's three years typically of didactic training or in class school training, and then on top of it, you have to attend a certain amount of births in different categories. So, you know, you can walk in and observe a birth, and that counts in one category. But by the end, you have to have done a certain amount of births that are what we call continuities of care, where you've seen a client over the course of, of over the span of at least two trimesters. You're at the birth, you catch their baby, you do the newborn exam, you do the postpartum, and essentially you've acted as the primary midwife under guidance of a midwife. So. It tends to be a, a rigorous... A long program. Yeah, and it's a lot of hours, especially spent at birth, where, you know, you're not getting paid to be there. Um, yeah. And on top of it, you're paying for school. So it is, it can it's be... It's an enormous investment and commitment. It is, it is. But you come out of it with medical training. You yeah. diagnostic training, therapeutic interventional training um, as needed. So that's, you know, the difference, it's essentially like the obstetrician at the home birth yeah. or the hospital birth. And, and that's essentially how I explain it to people. Surgery. Yeah. So funny story, I, I went to pick up my kids from school a week and a half ago, and my daughter's three and a half, and she apparently had showed up to school one morning. I was at a birth, and she had told everybody that I was giving birth. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everyone was a little bit confused because I'm obviously not pregnant, nor do I look <laughs> pregnant. And so, um, you know, I made it to pick up that day, um, and her teacher comes out, and she says, she told me you were giving birth this morning. <laughs> I said, she, she, I think she meant I was out of her. She said, oh, yeah, no, I figured you were with one of your doula clients. Mm-hmm, yeah. And I said, well, actually, I'm a midwife. And she said, what's the difference? Right. That's a big question. It is, and I get it a lot. And that's typically what I say is that a doula is, is an invaluable person for labor support. I mean, they are worth their weight in gold. But they're there for labor support, where the midwife replaces your doctor, essentially. So I'm the medical care provider. Exactly. So now to make it a little more confusing, you have this monotrice, which is sort of an in-between. A lot of people talk about, you know, I kind of want a home birth, but I, I want the safety blanket of a hospital, so I'll go to a birth center. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is like, you know, the best of both worlds. I'm like, I don't know if it is. Like when you live just as far from the hospital as the birth center, you're essentially giving birth in somebody else's home. But I actually do believe that to some degree the monotrice is the in-between home birth and hospital birth because now you have a medical provider doing your labor support. And so it's sort of like doula with the medical benefits. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. And I don't know if this is where the word comes from, but monotrice, you can monitor a lot of stuff. Yep. (laughs) You can monitor the mother's vital signs, their pulse, blood pressure, temperature, things like that. that Mm -hmm doulas can't. You can monitor the baby's yep. hard tones and make sure that baby sounds happy as a clam. Yep. And you can monitor the cervix. You mm-hmm. can find out like as doulas, we usually, you know, there's signs we can go on as to how far along you are, but sometimes kind of we get the game. little surprise. You get to the hospital think you're nine and you're two. Yep. <laughs> that doesn't happen with the monitors because no. you, you can check. Correct. So one group of people who I think can benefit a lot from having a monotrice or I think anybody, like if you want to have a baby and stay home as long as possible and then go to the hospital towards the end, mm-hmm. then a monotrice is the best way to do it uh, because you can be monitored the whole time and you never have that surprise getting there too early. And you have the confidence of somebody who's usually delivers babies at home. So this is their comfort zone. Yeah. Where sometimes doulas get a little nervous, like maybe we waited too long or, you know, they, they kind of don't have as much information available to them and as much confidence and experience like you talked about what uh, midwifery training is like. They don't have that kind of experience to stay home. So doulas can be amazing, but monotresis can be an amazing in another way if you want to stay home as long as possible. Another group who I think could benefit from monotrice care are people who are doing VBACs and their doctors don't insist that they come to the hospital right away. Yeah, I actually, I was um, I was once contacted actually by uh, someone who wanted a hospital birth. She was going for a VBAC, and the reason for her primary cesarean, or the first cesarean she had, was uh, D cells late in labor. Mm-hmm. And so she felt comfortable in the hospital environment. She found a extremely an extremely supportive care provider to support her through a VBAC. Um, wanted to labor at home for as long as possible, but obviously had that inherent fear that her baby wasn't going to tolerate labor again. And so she was a prime example of someone who really benefits from having that extra monitoring at home because we know that fear 
impacts of labor and how labor progresses. And so if she stayed home without monitoring or without that safety blanket that she really needed, that security knowing that her baby was tolerating labor okay, if she stayed home without that monitoring, it's very likely that she'd go to the hospital pretty early to get on a monitor. Exactly. Because her labor just wouldn't progress as well at home with that fear. So she was a, a great example of someone who would benefit from monotrice care over doula care. I think also, I'm the first person to say this, home birth is for people that feel really safe at and home. secure in that option, yeah. um, who really want to give birth at home. If there is an ounce of doubt in someone's mind that home is the right place for them, it's probably not the right place for them. Mm-hmm. And they will more likely end up in the hospital because of that fear. Um, And there is a beauty to midwifery care. There's a beauty to spending an hour talking with clients or talking with your care provider and feeling free to ask them all kinds of questions, not feeling like you're being rushed or that their time is, is more valuable than your questions. So I do believe that anybody benefits from midwifery care as a whole, and therefore anybody would benefit from monotrice care Mm -hmm. um, because there's just so much value in what we do over the course of pregnancy in keeping our moms low risk, in in making sure our moms feel safe and secure in the decisions that they're making, or even just helping with informed decision making. You know, typically when you're in obstetrical care, you follow a standard of care. You know, this test is offered at this week and this test is offered at this week. So even spending time talking to our monotrice clients about what those tests are, what their options are, the right questions to be asking, there's, I mean, there's so much value in that for anybody. I have lots more monetaries questions within me. <laughs> but alas, it's time for another quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Abby Vidikin. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We're talking about monetaries care with Abby Vidikin. All right, so... If you're laboring at home with your client and you go to the hospital, what does your role become once you get to the hospital? So once we transition into into the hospital, my role essentially becomes doula. I'm there for comfort and therapeutic touch. And if my clients would like help making decisions, I'm there to help talk them through any decisions that they need to make. And there is their advocate um, to make sure that ideally their birth plan is followed as much as possible, whether it's, you know, delaying, um, uh, doing immediate skin to skin, delaying cord clamping, uh, not weighing the baby right away, you know, making sure the baby's latched when, when if they choose a vitamin K shot. So just making sure that ideally their birth plan is followed through as much as possible. So essentially, once we step into the hospital, I really take on the role of, of a doula. At Those that are all point. the doula things. So yeah. the, even though at home you have medical benefits to having a monetary, once you get to the hospital, because you don't have privileges Correct. at the hospital, you can't do any of the medical things that you're trained to do. Correct. And that all turns over. But you probably, I would imagine, when medical things are being done, have a better understanding of what's happening or if choices have to be made, have a better understanding of the implications of those choices of medical procedures. Yeah. So, you know, the extent that I think the average doula can give input and some guidance as to what options are as medical things are happening, you you have a better, more experience and a better understanding with the medical side of things. Right. Like I find that, you know, typically in a hospital setting, there's there's a lot of talk always about heart tones, for instance. And when the baby's having, you know, slight decelerations, what does that mean? And so, yes, as a medical care provider, I could tell you the difference between variable D cells or late D cells and what the difference is and what those things mean. And although doulas sometimes pick that up by going to birth after birth after birth, right. it's not really part of the training in Correct. most doula programs. Right. So, yeah, that's what I meant by, you know, better able to interpret, to help interpret and understand what is and what isn't happening. When you go to a birth that you're going to do at home, Mm -hmm. what do you bring to that home birth versus when you go to do monotrice care at a home? Because your role as midwife and and monotrice are, are pretty different. Right. So my car is almost always packed for a home birth. Not because I'm planning for that monotrice client to deliver at home, but just because I'm at any point in time, I'm usually on call for a home birth. And so my car will typically be packed with my home birth supplies. Mm -hmm. Um, When I'm just going for a monotrice client, I only walk in with my prenatal bag. 
which would include my blood pressure cuff, my stethoscope, my Doppler. And that is pretty much the extent of what I would use for a monetary's client. Gloves, gel, stuff like that to do mm -hmm. a vaginal exam if they wanted. If we had agreed beforehand that they would like me to do IV antibiotics in labor. So, for instance, if a client is GBS positive or group B strep positive and they've decided to do IV antibiotics in labor, then I will bring in the antibiotics as well as IV fluids with me. Well, wait a second. There's definitely a, de a benefit to yeah. monetary care that we didn't talk about, like yeah. who's a good person, you know, who would benefit most from monetary yeah. care. Otherwise, they have to go to the hospital pretty early. Yeah, correct. So if you are GBS positive, uh, it's usually recommended that you get there a minimum of four hours prior to delivery. But if your water breaks, your care provider will more often than not ask that you come in as soon as your water breaks. And partially because we don't know when four hours before delivery is. Right, which makes it difficult for a doula to time that out if someone does want IV antibiotics on board before uh, four hours before, before delivery, birth, yeah. How at do a we, hospital. How do we know when that's There's no little right. app that tells you when that's going to happen. Definitely, definitely not. So, yes, that's certainly a benefit is that we can start an IV as well as IV antibiotics at home if the client's requested them in labor. So that's the extent of what I bring in if I am a monotrice. For a home birth, I have bigger bags and more of them. Some of the life-saving medical equipment that home birth midwives carry on them would include an oxygen tank with a infant mask as well as an adult mask. So if mom or baby needed any O2 support, we carry that, as well as resuscitation equipment for the baby. I do, as mentioned, carry IV fluids and IV antibiotics, as well as anti-hemorrhagics or medications to stop bleeding postpartum. Um, so if a mom was hemorrhaging postpartum, or it appeared that she may hemorrhage postpartum, and also suture equipment. That's a question I get quite a bit, actually, from, from when I'm interviewed is, can I suture? And yes, licensed midwives, we are trained to suture. We do bring numbing medication. So we do oh, bring to lidocaine yeah. to suture. That's another question I oh, get. Well, do you, you numb me? Do it oh. Yes, no, no, I numb you. <laughs> and it's a local anesthetic. And and that's, I mean, that's the crux of the stuff that we bring in terms of life-saving supplies. So, but I also have essential oils and the Rebozo and, and other things. That doula, I, more doula stuff. Yes. And then also everything that the baby would need postpartum. So I don't, aside, you know, the three primary things that the baby gets after birth would be a vitamin K shot, or the erythromycin, eye ointment, and then a hepatitis B vaccine if they were being born in the hospital. I carry two of those. I don't. No hep B. No hep B at home. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, so I have patients who are really, really, really on the fence mm -hmm. between home birth and hospital birth. Mm -hmm. And they just don't have enough data to decide. And they want to give birth at home but feel like that once it starts, they may want to go to the hospital. Or the opposite, they think they want to go to the hospital but they feel like once it starts and it's progressing and they're like, hey, I'm doing okay, they may want to stay home. And so on the one hand, I think a monotrice is a good call here. But on the other hand, it really has to be set up from the beginning because even just everything you just talked about from oxygen and resuscitation equipment and suturing equipment and anti-bleeding drugs that are commonly given after a baby's born are not in the typical monotrice bag. Nope. And also when you deliver a baby, you have a backup with you, right, or an yeah. assistant. Yeah. So I, yes, we midwives will always have an assistant present at the birth because once the baby is born, there's two, I never refer to them as patients, but there's two patients. <laughs> uh, it's hard to call the baby my you client. Did it. Uh, <laughs> but there's two patients and obviously, you know, you, well, you need there's hands. there's two people to take care of. Exactly. And, um, right, you need hands. And if they both need something at the same time, then even, you would they, need even though person. you have two hands, you sort of need two per person. I do. Um, so that's another reason you can't just go with this plan of, well, you know what, I'll get them on a tree and we'll see how it goes. I won't tell her that I'm secretly thinking, well, maybe if I just stay home long enough, the baby will come out there. You kind of have to plan that ahead of time. Yeah, and more often than not, I will be asked by a monotrice client, how late can I decide that I want a home birth? And ideally, I'd like to know by 34 to 36 weeks that this is what you're planning. And primarily, it has to do with the time it will take to play catch up to get. So as midwives in a home birth setting, we, we will often operate under different standards than an OB in a hospital where there's an OR down the hall or there's blood, you know, downstairs that if someone easily needs to be transfused. And so we look for different things throughout our care and establish risk differently. So I want to be able to look at your labs and review your labs. I want to see your ultrasounds. I want to make sure that, you know, 
we've we've talked about all of the things in terms of shifting to a home birth as early in the process as possible. But if someone comes to me at 34, 36 weeks and says, you know what, I know you, I love you, I trust you, I want to do this with you at home, I'm not going to say no. I'm just going to say, all right, we just have to move fast. We have to make up for last time. We do. It's, we have to play catch up at that point. Yeah. I mean, and I'd rather plan. Like I know you say this too. I'd rather plan to stay home and possibly end up in the hospital than plan to go to the hospital and, and end up staying end home. Up staying home, right? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's powerful. That's going to be like a little. I bet that's going to end up on our little audiogram that we use <laughs> on social media because that's a really powerful message, you know. Right. Um. So, how many people? reach out to you for monetary care and end up having a home birth? I mean, they just, once they meet you, because you're so, like, passionate about it, and I think that you instill confidence about it. So funny. Well, I know two people personally. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> already, who um, came to you seeking monetary care mm -hmm. and then decided to do home birth. Is that a common thing? Yes, um, because I think what ultimately happens throughout the process is that you know, you're you're seeing these clients sort of side by side with their OB appointments that are five minutes and they often feel rushed and less heard. And there's wonderful OBs out there who, you know, operate slightly differently. But for the most part, it's still very short appointments. The OB is typically running late. And then you have this midwife who shows up and sits and schmoozes and gets to know you over the course of hour-long appointments. And you're seeing her regularly. And with my monetary clients, I still take their vitals. I still um, feel their baby. I want to I want to palpate. I want to know where that baby is. I want to know what a normal baseline blood pressure is for my client. Because I feel that one of the things that makes midwifery care so safe is understanding your client's normal. Right. There is a range of normal blood pressure out there. But if you have a client that's blood pressure tends to be on the lower end of normal, and then in labor, we're shifting towards the higher end of normal, or their pulse is usually on the low end of normal, and now it's, you know, above 100. Like, we want to understand why that's happening. Are they mm. just working really hard, or is something else happening? And so I want to make sure that even if I'm taking someone to the hospital at the end, that I have established a good understanding of their body and what their normal is during pregnancy. And then especially, again, making sure that that baby's in a good position. And so I think what ends up happening or what I've noticed ends up happening is you've developed this relationship, you've established this rapport with them, you've shown them that you have these skills, and you've taken the time to hear them and listen to them and talk through their plans and their goals for their birth. And part of that, unfortunately, is, is explaining to a client what it's like when we get to the hospital. And so, you know, you Google birth plan and you get these great birth plans that are, I don't want an IV and don't touch me this way and don't do that to me. And it's, it's explaining to the clients also that while it's great to not want an IV, you're usually going to get at least a hep block. And while it's great to sort of ask you these things, when you step into the hospital setting, there's liability involved for them, and there is a way that they have to do things. And you might end up with a nurse on her worst day who may not be the nicest to you. And so you have to prepare yourself for what it's like when you get to the hospital. And so part of that also is having that conversation. And I think sometimes that's usually where people make that shift. Like, well, she's great, and I get to talk to her so much, and she would probably be a better person. I mean, she'd, it would probably be more fun if she caught my baby than if anybody else did. And so... I find that somewhere along the way, there's just that shift to, you know, I want everything you described, not... Right. So I was at a local hospital event where the hospital was reaching out to doulas, and one of the hospital representatives said, you know, they're trying really hard to be flexible mm -hmm. and more open-minded to different birth plans and supportive of the type of birth that the laboring person wants to have. But she did end up saying, just know that... There is a degree to which when you buy a hospital ticket, you're going on a hospital ride. And that's right. from the hospital who is trying to be more open-minded. Right. Um, and and that's, it's, it's true. And I, and I speak from very personal experience to my clients. I planned a hospital birth with, you know, this home birth midwife aunt who had done hundreds of home births at that point in time, who I had, you know, telling me, you know, guiding me and informing me. And I planned you know, for the best possible hospital birth. And in a lot of ways, I got that, but I was still in the hospital system. And so after the birth, after my midwife left the room, I had to 
be in that hospital system. And I was I was a patient at that hospital, as was my son. And I think actually so much of what left me sort of anxious after my birth with my son was that, you know, here I described as every cell in my body screaming for him to be with me at all times. But then I also felt powerless over where he was at any given time. So if someone wanted to take him to the nursery to have a test done, it was as if I couldn't say no. You know, you feel somewhat powerless in that environment. And yet at the same time, I understand that they have liability to deal with and they have they have things that they need to do, boxes they need to check. And so, so I, I tell my Your practice clients, doesn't have a big legal department. No, it doesn't. Yeah. And, I, and I planned a home birth for my second. I've lived the difference in, in how birth can be. Aside from just doing it, I was that woman postpartum in, you know, the postpartum unit of a hospital after delivering a baby unmedicated, as well as the woman postpartum, freshly postpartum, in my bed, Mm -hmm. you know, tucked in by, fortunately for me, my aunt, the midwife, surrounded by women that were supportive, that weren't questioning my milk supply, that didn't insist on weighing my baby or poking my baby or doing anything to my baby for that first two hours postpartum. And so much of, of the experiences that I've lived have shifted into my practice. Like, one of the things I value so much and I really try to give to every one of my clients is is not just the golden hour, the golden two hours. Take the time you need. Define Be- the golden hour because I don't think know, know what that is. So it's that hour immediately following birth where we really try to leave mom and baby as a single unit completely uninterrupted by other people. So it's leaving baby skin to skin on mom, allowing baby to explore the breast when he or she is ready, and really delaying all procedures or anything that has to be done until after mom and baby have enjoyed that hour. So no weighing, measuring, washing, all that weights of the injections or drops or anything that they're going to do, as long as baby looks good. I don't even cut the cord. Oh, really? Um, For how I'm, long? Usually until I'm ready to do the newborn exam, which is typically after two hours. Wow. Mostly because, again, there's nothing – There, it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with cutting the cord earlier. Mm-hmm. It's just that in its own way, an intervention, it's 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 meddling when we shouldn't be meddling. It's, yeah. it's doing something to the baby that doesn't have to be done in that moment. Do you ever see somebody um, burn the cord? I have. I just – we uh, we have a <laughs> client do that. Yeah. Uh, I just had a client ask me about lotus birth, and when I explained it to her, she was like, nope. <laughs> no. um, gosh, we ran out of time. I know. It goes fast. It does go what fast. I tell you? But I think that we covered a lot of information about monotrice, which is what mm-hmm. this episode was all about. I think that now listeners will have a much better idea of the difference between a doula and a monotrice and a midwife. This is our goal. And an obstetrician. And also got to hear a really cool story of, <laughs> uh, of how you became a midwife and all the midwific power behind you from the generation above. Very cool. Yeah. Um, where can we find you? Um, so you can find me online. Um, I am at hearttohomemidwifery.com. I'm sure if you Heart Google. to home midwifery. Heart to home midwifery. You can find me on Instagram, LA Midwife Abby. Super original. <laughs> <laughs> A-B-B-Y. A-B-B-Y. And I'm sure if you just Google Midwife Abby, LA, I'd probably come up. Yeah, you'd come up in a lot of places, including the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. Yes, I will, finally. Thanks so much for joining us, Abby. And at home, thanks for listening. If you like our program, share us with your friends. And if you have a topic idea, send it to info at informedpregnancy.com. I got on.